Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Random. Egberto is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today again, coming in from another location, not up in the studio. Man, I tell you, we're, we're, we're kind of enjoying this, this new venue. Anyhow, folks, welcome to Politics and Right. Uh, let's see who's in the house. Bridge MCP in the house. Lee Grant in the house. Eric Hayes in the house. Bruce Pollard back from L.A. and catching up in the house. Yvette Avery Herod in the house and i think there is there's great news for yvette i think i really uh, e2247 is in the house as well avq uh el senor rodney anyhow yvette i don't know if you if you can or not but if you can give us a quick call at 281-823-7747 i would love to just get a two or three minute commentary because I read the items that the UPS strike resolution turned out to be. And I'm not sure I'd like to hear it from you. It seems to me like everything you were asking for, you got. When I say you, I'm not only talking about Yvette Avery uh, Herod, I'm also talking about all the UPS workers, part-time and not, as well as the 22 fours. It seemed like the 22 fours got what they wanted as well. I would love to hear from you. I'm going to say the number slow in the event that you can call. 281-823-7747. Love for you to kind of give our posse an update as far as are you happy? Is this something that should pass? I would like to know from the from the mouth of the person who's out there in the field taking care of business, if you can. That is, if you can. All right, let's see what else we have. Um, Michael Rodney said the 340,000 part-timers who are were, were screwed getting wages soon. That's what it seems like. Uh, it seems like new part-timers come in, I think, if I read the report correct, at $21, which is a far cry from, I think, the $16 that they came in, they come in at. All right, let's come in here. Uh, Yvette, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm well. How about you? I am well. Please tell me if um, am I reading that correctly? That uh, you guys got what you wanted. Well, right now we just have limited information because we don't have the full information. But we do know that the twenty-two four, like you mentioned, the current job that I hold will be gone. Uh, we do know that they will start the part timers off at twenty-one dollars an hour with some increases. Uh, that may be a little uh, spot for some, but we it's only up to the vote of the membership at this point. So we'll keep working through August 1st, but then we'll have to wait on the vote to see whether the members say yes to everything that changed once we get the information or if they vote no. Yeah, but interestingly, if I understand the the, the items in the contract, actually, the Teamsters released a a, um, a press release, and I was looking for everything that you told me on that interview that we spoke to, and, I, and it was like, if that is correct, check. If that is correct, check. If that is correct, in fact, it seems like, and tell me if I'm wrong or right here, it seems like you are due a fairly large pay increase. Well, I definitely will be getting a pay increase. Like I said, since my... Uh... 22 form uh, position has been eliminated. I definitely will get an increase, and by the end of the contract, should be making around forty nine dollars an hour. So, right, that's definitely plus. Right, that's what I thought I read, and when I said that, I'm like, you know what? You guys fought for it, uh, and, and you got it. And and you know, I mean, I, I think I would, and, and you know, it's it's amazing because your success means the success for even those that are not in unions now. So it, you know, what you guys have accomplished, I think it is, uh, it is great. Now you got to bring everybody into unions, and I think uh, having somebody like you working on that is exactly what we need. It definitely will be very helpful. They can see for themselves what it takes as a union to fight, and what workers can get when they stick together. Absolutely. So, well, look, Yvette, thank you so kindly for calling in. Thank you for that interview, and I can tell you one thing. I think UPS realized that. America had your back. I honestly think they would not have made that contract if they didn't know all of America had your back and they were profiting off of everything you guys did. I mean, when I when I played that stuff, this when some people heard that the, the the story about how you guys had to work through the pandemic, 
It was simply astounding. They couldn't believe that 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 is something that was happening here in America. Yvette, did I did I lose you? Okay, it seems I don't know. It seems like we lost Yvette. No, I'm still here. I just oh, didn't wanna, okay. I, I was trying to mute out my background, but yeah, I'm still here. So yeah, oh, okay. definitely. Uh, the word helped. I think getting out those stories helped everybody see what we actually had to deal with. So I truly appreciate you know avenues like politics done right for allowing us to get that message out. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people were out there on uh, on y'all sites. I mean, I heard it everywhere. Let me just tell you that it was all over. People were talking about it. So congratulations. And I'm I'm very happy for you and your team. Thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. Have a great day, Vet. Thank you so kindly for calling in. All right. Bye -bye. Anyhow, folks, that is, you know, I, I love you remember when we used to have all those things on the outside and we would talk about that's what democracy looks like. That's what democracy looks like. This is what unionization looks like. That all the spoils don't go to those who don't do the work. That the spoils go to those who deserve the spoils. Anyway, let me read the comments real quickly. And then we have a fairly long interview that I got to get to like now so that we can actually fulfill the program. Uh, let's see. I heard the story, Michael Rudnan, about the Black guy who got the, the all the other officers were telling him, do not. The guy came out of the truck. His hands were up. They said, do not send the dog at the guy. And the guy just went ahead and sent him anyway. That is what intrinsic hate looks like. Anyhow, we'll talk about that another time. Bruce says, now there are two. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Bruce, but I'm sure you'll tell me in a little bit. Uh, Eric Hay says, guess someone was watching your show, Politics Done Right with Egberto Willis, UPS and Tipsa. I had nothing to do with it. All of us had something to do with it. Lee Grant, uh, Lee Grant, yesterday, I don't know if you heard uh, an apology I gave to you because there's something that you said uh, that I that I hyperventilated on, something that I don't like to do unless I, you know, I have reason to do it. And you caught me red-handed on that one. Check the video out if you don't see if you if you didn't hear it. Melanie Keelan is in the house from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, let's see. Eric Hay says, if it affected the strike, congrats, and had nothing to do with the administration. See, don't need government. Actually, the administration was on their side. So I think you need to think twice before you say that, brother. Uh, we got Daniel Adosa. Let me guess. The posse is completely unaware the Biden crimes are coming to light. Your boy is in hot water. I love, I, I love how you guys allow these guys to really fool you over and over again. It's right around the corner. Trump is going to win. You remember all of you guys were here telling me, wait a minute, you're going to see what happens. You guys just don't know what's happening. Every time something is going to go down and you guys never get it right. And they pull the snow in front of you over and over again. You send them your money and you fall on your face. But that's okay. Carl Cox is in the house. Biden has nothing to do with both Bush crime family and the Trump crime family. Awesome Yvette from Bridge MCP. Congratulations, Yvette from Melanie Keelan. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, administration had nothing to do with this strike. If you don't think the administration had some words out there, you are dreaming. To Rudnan, the part-timers received uh, more movement than we've ever seen in the past in wages, but their vote will determine what they feel about it. That is absolutely right. Uh, let's see, Egberto, the lady you interviewed this morning, takeaway uh, for you was very, was everything has value. Uh, I think I think you need to listen to the interview. I, again, I'm gonna give it to play it right now. But anyway, here is an important interview, I think, I did with a lady, uh, a pro, uh, a rather uh, anti-abortion lady. Check this out. And then we'll take it on the other side. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we are honored to have Jacinta Robin. Jacinta Robin is the director of the intern program at the Center for Bioethical Reform. She is a pro-life renowned speaker. She is a Jacksonville, Florida resident and is on the state board of Florida Right to Life. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Jacinta, how are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. Well, you know, I had I, I had to talk to you, especially in these times where we're having this large fight about pro-life, uh, pro-this, or, or that sort of thing. 
First of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're doing what you're doing? Sure, absolutely. Um, I got hired with CBR about two years ago. Um, mm-hmm. They invited me to take over their summer intern program, and I agreed to do it. I'm a Florida resident, and mm-hmm. they are in Tennessee. So that should show my commitment. I agree to come up here just for the summer to run the summer intern program because I'm passionate about this work. I want the next generation of pro-life activists to know what I know and what I've learned over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm 34. Um, I know I look young, but I'm 34. I learned about what abortion was when I was 17. Let me ask you to stop before we get there, because what I'd like to know is I'd like to know a little bit about your history, maybe uh, your religion, how you grew up, that sort of a thing. Oh, I see. Okay, I was raised Catholic and I have maintained um, that faith. So I am a present practicing Catholic. Um, That was a part of what led me to doing pro-life work. Um, We actually have a stance where we're against birth control and we're against abortion at all stages of development. Um, I am from a family of seven. So we have two in heaven and I have uh, four remaining siblings. I'm the first of all of them. Um, Meaning you're the eldest. I'm the eldest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a lot of fun. It's a lot of responsibility. So I'm right in my element doing the intern program because I'm mentoring and that's just something I feel like I've done my whole life is showing people what to do. Um, That's just kind of how life was growing up. So I'm very acclimated to that. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, you, you, you you maintain the Catholic stance, which is uh, no birth control or uh, you, you believe in absolutely no, no, no contraception. And as far as abortion is controlled, at no stage you do you believe in abortion? Correct. No artificial birth control. Um, we do we do promote abstinence mm-hmm. um, even within a marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's up to you to control mm-hmm. when you want to come together as a couple. Mm-hmm. We feel like that's in your purview. That's up to you. But mm-hmm. when that intimate encounter happens. Should that result in a conception, you are now parents mm-hmm. of a very tiny person. Mm-hmm. So, so that is that is your core belief. Your core belief is that uh, that that as far as uh, no contraception and that also uh, life begins at conception. Yes, and it was actually my faith that drove me into the direction of pro-life activism, but it was in a very curious way. So I started college early. I started when I was 16 and I was a biology major. Mm -hmm. So I could see the baby, the one celled embryo. Mm -hmm. And I was conflicted because that one cell to me did not look like a baby. Mm -hmm. And yet as a Catholic, I needed to uphold the belief that this was an entity that should not be harmed Mm -hmm. and it should not be expelled at will. So I had a conflict in my own heart. I could see that this was a cell, a single cell organism on day one. And yet the church was saying you cannot abort in the earliest stages. So essentially I was pro-choice up until the point that the baby looked like a baby. And I had a bit of a problem. I didn't want to just ignore what the church taught. So I did some research and what I found was very jarring. I remember I was at work. I worked as a tutor at the school for biology and it was a Saturday. We didn't have a whole lot of students come in. So I had a whole lot of free time on my hands and I went and I took myself to the computer and I said, I need to solve this problem. I need to figure out why the church is so insistent that at all stages of development, you should not abort. So I went to Google and I looked up abortion. I looked up early, early abortion. I looked up a, um, I can't remember exactly the words I put in, but I made sure that it was early. And what I found was a second trimester abortion and had to be about 14 weeks. And I was shocked at how developed the child was. And I realized two things. I realized number one, that looked like a small human. Mm 
And in my mind, I thought it wouldn't look like a small human. I thought it would look more like a clump of cells, which is what we hear all the time. I was shocked that at 14 weeks, it kind of looked like a human being. I didn't know that. What I also realized was that all of us develop at different rates. Some of us get taller faster. Some of us get wider faster. Babies develop at different rates. They're usually, they're usually in the same range, but none of us grows at the exact same rate. So you're dealing with laws that are being passed, cutting off at hard breaks, 20 weeks. You can't abort past 20 weeks. But how does this politician know that the baby you're carrying isn't hyperdeveloped at 20 weeks and it can feel pain and it could survive outside of the womb? Right now at 20 weeks, they have a 50% chance of survival. So it was, it was so, it encompassed so many scenarios that it wasn't fair for there to be a hard break. I realized that we were putting this responsibility of drawing a line on people's development when everybody develops at a different rate. So then the argument is, well, we should just draw that line when it doesn't look like a baby among the earliest stages of development, which is why you're getting a lot of heartbeat bills now, which is in my opinion, a good thing. At the very least, they're stopping it at six weeks. Um, some states are still at 15 weeks. North Carolina is considering a 12-week bill. So you kind of see everybody's kind of on that same mindset. It's like, when do we draw this line? Where do we draw that hard break where we can say, look, at this point, we know it's not human. It can't possibly be human. It doesn't look like a human being. Okay, that's where they are right now. But if they're being honest with themselves, they're doing too much. Nobody should take on that responsibility to determine when your life has value and at what point your development determines how eligible you are now to be considered a part of society. Because the second you draw a line on a seamless, a seamless process of development, you're lying to yourself. Because in biology, once you get started, once that embryo is conceived, it just continues. It doesn't tell you when it quote unquote becomes a human being. So now you're given the burden of determining when that magical moment is. And that's dishonest because nobody has a good answer for that. That's why all these states are on different sides of the issue. So I take the approach that if it's alive and if it's human, it's a human who is being, it is a human being. And our constitution protects human beings. So that embryo deserves protection under the law. So at that point, I know it's a bitter truth, right? Everybody's going through after they hear my explanation. They either want me to shut up or keep going. So did I, <laughs> did I ever once uh, ask you to shut up? No, no. But I, I know your viewers are probably going to be like, oh, boy. No, that won't be my viewers in this interview. That's going to be me. But I want to hear your entire frame. Because what, what I do, let me, let, let me be clear to you. Mm -hmm. I, I always listen with the expectation that I can find some relevancy or some truth in what I'm hearing to see if you are going to change any one of my stances. because. Okay. My theory is as follows. If we are truly a society made up of intelligent people, we should be able to listen to each other and rationalize what each other says. And after that rationalization, come to a conclusion. So I, that's why I asked you about your upbringing in the beginning, et cetera, because I wanted to know who you were or who you are. Is there mm -hmm. something else that you want to add to that? long pros because I think I am ready to answer quite a few of those unless you have additional information you'd like to add to that. Um, I would just say once I resolved that question in my heart, I started volunteering. And every day I was doing something, something that I could to help advance the pro-life movement because I was convicted. Okay, great. And that's that's great. Based on your based on your Catholic upbringing, by the way, I'm original from Central America. I was a born Catholic. 
I and saw I, that. Yeah. yeah. And then after <laughs> that, I became from a Catholic. I became a Baptist from a Baptist. I went to the University of Texas, became a Maranatha, which is one of those sort of third party type uh, Christian okay. churches. And after uh, after I found out that uh, certain things about the Christian religion, I left church altogether and became a humanist. So all, the only thing that I'm worried about is uh, the the um, the success of humanity, if you will. That said, um, I be, I believe in the faith that you have and the, and the, and what you believe in, and that's fine. My first question to you, however, is uh, that is what you believe, and that is your religion. Uh, yes. That's what that is. Now, uh, in, in a in a pluralistic society like ours, with multi religion, no religion, whatever. Um, how do you dare ask others to simply fall in line with what you believe? And I'm not talking abortion right now, because if if you okay. can do that with a, if you can do that with an abortion, you can do that with just about anything. We can make my religion be preeminent to what needs to be done. And I think. As nice as you are, as sweet as you are, uh, when you when when the statements that you're making are neither sweet or nice, because in effect you're saying do it my way. So your comments right. on that? Okay. Well, I think that's a good question, and I would separate um, some of what was mentioned here. So I decided to respect the idea that life starts at conception because my faith challenged me right. to learn more about the issue. Mm -hmm. I don't think that this is a religious question, though. You don't and think that, right? I don't. I don't think that. So when we're out, our organization, when we go out, we do activism, a lot of times on college campuses, we'll have students come up to us and they'll say, you know, is this a religious organization? Are you guys trying to push your faith and your beliefs on us? And we say, no, this is not a religious organization. We are a science-based organization. So we are the Center for Bioethical Reform. We're targeting biological issues with an ethical perspective so a lot of people would agree yes I'm a, Pause. Uh, because we we have to be intentional here whose ethics that's a that's an excellent question and this is why i'm trying to segue into my next topic right now in denmark i believe there are no down syndrome people okay they cure they they've attested to curing down syndrome you want to know how they did that they did that by testing embryos in the womb to see if they tested positive for trisomy 21. And if that gene was present, they recommended to the mother that she abort. And these mothers did. So now Down syndrome has eradicated. been eradicated. Yeah. I'll tell you another one. Right now in China, you have more boys than girls. How do we get that? Usually in the population, Okay, the way that human beings reproduce, you'll typically get more girls than boys. Um, I, uh, a fertility specialist who's a friend of mine, she uh, said, if you, if you go to bed with your husband and that night there's an egg present in your womb, you're going to get a boy. If you go to bed with your husband and tomorrow there's an egg in your womb, you're going to get a girl. They call it lazy sperm. That, that one gives you a girl, but the day of gives you a boy. It's hard to get it to happen that day of. So by default, most pregnancies are females, okay? But China has a very curious problem. There are more boys than girls, okay? India also has that problem because the girls are more expensive. When you're marrying them off, you have to marry them off with dowries. So all of a sudden, you're seeing these weird imbalances in the population, and it's abortion that's allowing this to happen. So now we're dealing with ethics. And I would not. No, argue. no, no. Actually, I will argue that I, I would argue that that now we're dealing with your ethics. Let me give an example, because you in, in using the Down syndrome example. Right. I could actually make the ethical. I could make the ethical argument that says if we can if, if we can avoid Down syndromes, 
yeah. that more of the other kids would live. I could make an ethical statement that says, let, 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 let me expand a little bit more. I find that your concern for an embryo mm-hmm. or a, a clump of cells, or to some extent, the lack of a concern for the carrier of the baby, I would find that in my of in my opinion, unethical. Why would I find it unethical? And that's why I said who's ethics, right? Mm-hmm. I would find it unethical because um, I find that we put so much effort into an embryo that after the ki- the kids are born, the same folks who have the ideology of conservatism and non-abortion, et cetera, they will not support the policies that make the born kids live. So I am saying if, if we want to talk ethics, if, if this was an, a real ethical issue, and as opposed to what your your uh, the people you go to the universities that talk about it being a religious issue, which I think it's still a religious issue. If it were a real ethical issue, we would say, wait a minute. We we care about the embryos, but when the embryos are turned into humans and born, we don't have the policies that keep them alive. We don't have the policies that prevent them from going to jail. We don't have these particular sets of policies. So it's not an ethical problem if you will allow death at the end stage, but you're trying to save something that isn't yet born. Okay. Again, I would separate the issue. So we're dealing with two issues here. We have Mm -hmm. the problem of should we treat pre-born children differently than should we than the way we treat born children? That's one problem. Because if a two-year-old was born and he was born in a very poor environment, there was no food, there was no water, we would not address the problem of him having no food and no water by killing him. No, we so wouldn't. Right now, no, we wouldn't. So we right would feed now, him. Right. Now but, all of a sudden but, but, we want to take but care you don't of them. Want, but you don't want to feed them. I and I and I will not. No, no, I, I'm, that, no, that's that. What I just said was a statement of fact. If you take yeah, a look I'm at the budget, that. I'm saying yeah. we're dealing with two issues. Well, we're right. dealing with two issues. We're dealing with the mother who has to get food stamps to take care of her child, mm-hmm. who's also encouraged to birth her child and not abort it because she doesn't have the money to feed her. Exactly. Courage. Right. This is a big problem. I, right. I understand that. But I will also tell you this. Right now, I'm an African-American woman. Obviously, you're a person of color. Right now in New York City, more African-American children are aborted than born. Time wait, out. Wait, you can, uh, no, wait, no. I, that, it, I, I saw that message. In, I, I, you know, I normally don't interrupt my, my, the person on the interview, but uh, okay. what, ha- what happens too often is we try. We're not, we're not talking race here. The, the abortion issue is not a racial issue, no matter how the right would try to make it a racial issue. It, they're, they're, I understand how it wouldn't be a racial issue. It's not a racial issue at all. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an abortion issue. And, and what the, the right would often do is bring race into the discussion so that people's emotions will start saying, oh, that's racist or that's not racist. The thing about it is white women Black women, Latino women, Asian women all have abortions. The reason why Black women have abortion at a, uh, in some instances at a larger rate is because of the social economic conditions. It has very little to do with anything other than that. Uh, black women are just as promiscuous as white women are just as promiscuous as Asian women. All of those things are, I'm using promiscuity only because the right oh, likes to use they're, that. They're getting pregnant, right? They wouldn't be right. having the abortions if they weren't getting pregnant. I understand that. But I would I would challenge you to look at the situation that we have here, right? Mm-hmm. Um, African-American women are making up 14% of the population. Yes. That's generous. I'm afraid it might be less than that. It's 13% um, actually. Yeah, I, I would imagine it'll be closer to that. And right now, they are leaning to having almost 50% of all the abortions. There are almost 40% of all the abortions that are being taken place. So that's, that I, is, all, that is something that's to be expected given the socioeconomic differences. If you, if you take a look at the, the, the value, what, what these two different societies have, that's not at all, that's not at all off key kilter at all. Well, the problem, but I would, I would, I would still say 
you have encountered a complex problem Mm -hmm. and you're not going to, you would not be doing the right thing by being the mercenary Mm -hmm. to fix one problem. Um, and ignore the other problem. Good point. But Very I think good that's point. What we're doing with abortion. I, I, yeah. You see, I don't. Th- I mean, first of all, that is an excellent point that you brought there. We don't want to be mercenaries, but I'll tell you something, uh, just uh, Jacinta. The reality is, uh, bringing black kids into an America today, right? When you're poor or otherwise, it it is not at all inconceivable to me why one would want to abort kid. Kids, not kids, abort fetuses before they become what I consider a human being. Let me first tell you, I don't, I have a daughter, a little bit younger than you are. All right. And I don't want my daughter to have an abortion. I don't want my, I don't want any of those things for my daughter. Women don't have abortions for the sake of having abortions. We have an evil economic system in America. Very, I mean, conservatives like to sing glory, glory, hallelujah. That's not the truth. I, I, I would urge you as a conservative uh, to, to listen to my programs and be, come and be a part of my programs, because I can tell you something. We have an evil economic system and the abortion situation can be cured if we actually had a humane economic system that provided contraceptives in a society that's not going to run away from sex. And if we also had care, there are a lot of people, if we had a humane society, uh, we would actually have kids. There's a lot of women who are aborting kids, which they just cannot afford. Okay, well, I have a few rebuttals on that, and I need to know how much time you have. <laughs> well, we, we have about six more minutes, so go ahead. Okay, well, what I would say to what you mentioned is that the real problem here is we cannot confirm, we cannot come to agreement on what the preborn actually is. And that's because fine. Because that would, that would eliminate everything. If society could come to agreement, on what was actually inside of the woman, that would put every other law in place, every other privilege and practice in place. If we could all come to agreement that it is not a human being inside of the womb, then let her do whatever she wants and don't be sad about it. Don't say, it's a tragic thing if a woman has to have an abortion. Why? It's just a clump of cells. I don't think people really believe that. No, I I don't believe that. I don't. I think you're they know right. something really weird you know, is happening when an abortion you, takes place. You are so. I mean, I, you see, I don't want to deny. You know, and that's why I said the issue is with. I mean, I, I believe. I, I believe in that, but we as a society determine where life begins. Okay. Oh, that's, do we now? Yes. I mean, you a religiously. Oh, do we now? Yeah. Let me explain this. What I mean by that, your religion, as a Catholic. You can attest to what your religion tells you where life begins. Biologically speaking, uh, we can, you know, they're, they're, uh, as from a point of laws, we can say where things begin and how we are going to interpret it in law. This doesn't have anything to do with that. religion. I would challenge that. Biologists, no, no. 5,000 biologists came together. I need to check the numbers on this. But no, no, you're, uh, again, I know what you're going to say. 5,000 biologists came together, and they have confirmed Jacinta, you're... that life starts at conception. So Jacinta, there's no that's question. Fine. And... Jacinta, Jacinta, when a sperm meets an egg, it, it turns into a cygot, etc. cetera. It, it's fine. And, right. and I'm saying I don't care what the biologists say. I'm an engineer. I do not care what the biologists say from a legal standpoint. We have the right as a society to determine where life begins. If you have another religious option. But you're not determining where life begins because you just have said that life starts. No, no, no. I am saying we determine where the value of that life begins. That's what you're determining. Actually, I, I, I stand corrected. I think I think the way you said it was better. I think the way you said it was better. OK, so now. So but the fact that I'm saying is this. If you believe something about your body and what you want to do. The only thing that, and by the way, I take exception to a pro-life movement. I am a pro-life person. I believe in your life. I will do everything to save you as a living human being. Okay. You know what I don't believe in? 
I don't believe in your in 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 your dictatorial notion to tell another human being what they must what do for some life. what and not only that what they must be compelled to carry etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all i'm saying if you have a belief system i want you to live in your belief system and i want you to preach for your belief system i want you to do all of that i just don't want you to influence my belief system and well, I think I that is you. I agree with you. You are on the pretext of my body, my choice. I cannot agree with you more. And if that woman is carrying another body and she's being honorably consistent to that value setup, then she should also honor the baby's body. No, that's not that. That is that is a false equivalence. Let me let me tell you why. Because again, if she believes like I do that a a, a full fully formed human being is not one until birth. Then that's not the case, and 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 again, and I think the, the the truth of the matter is, I think, and I'm not talking about you as a person, but you as a movement has been one mm-hmm. of the most killing movements there are. Not you Why per you se, that? not you. Why do you say that? I say that because, first of all, with with the stance that women just can't have abortions, women with ectopic pregnancies and all of that have died. But let's go a little bit further. Uh, we've had um, uh, men who uh, perform abortions, murdered. I I had to take. I did an expose right here in Houston where the, they they terrorize women going in to get abortions. There's nothing. Look, if you if you feel so badly at about abortion, try to stop abortions from happening. Love on somebody. That's Give the somebody. Only who feels bad about abortion? You said you feel t- bad about abortions too. I feel, let me tell you why I feel bad about abortions, okay? Because I don't know. I, I accept my ignorance, okay? Ah, I, so now I, we don't know. Right, no, no, now no. we don't know. No, no, no. I, I don't get technical with me in that regard. It's okay to not know. It is but it's okay. not okay to determine someone's value if you don't know. Uh, no, no, no. So, I, actually, that's not entirely true because our values and you as a black woman, your value was determined and it still is determined right now because of this pigmentation of your skin. In a capitalist society, your value is much less than the value of a woman with the exact same characteristic as you. I, and that's another subject that I won't yeah, get into. Yeah, that's a different we won't, topic. We, yeah, it's another topic. We won't get into that. But what I'm saying is, Let's not in my no, I won't say that. Uh, let's I'm, I'll say it in a let's form. Let's not be naive to the reality that in society today we make choices and not only choices do we make, we make we balance our choices. And once we determine that uh, things become better, I mean, I look, you you're going to have a kid sometime, I, I imagine, if you don't have one already and you're going to give. What's that again? I hope so. Right. And you will have your values that you want to put into your kid. Work on that. You have your sphere of influence. Work on that. In fact, if you want to go around colleges and tell folks you shouldn't have abortions, do that. But when you start codifying into law what your belief system says that you want others to do, that is my problem. I have no problem with you as a person. But you're going to do that anyway. Are you a voter? Absolutely. Okay, Every so time. when you go to the ballot, you are imposing your belief on someone else's body. No, no, we are in a democracy, right? We, we live in a constitutional republic, but even even more so in a democracy. If we were a pure democracy and it was mob rule, it was majority rule. Well, yeah, yeah, there you we're go. We're going to lean <laughs> one way or another. No, so no, if here's you go this. to that ballot, you my are dear, impacting my someone dear, else's life, right? There are two things that we have in the Constitution, and, and I hate that the, the people on the right don't do a good job in doing this. But the Constitution, one of the fights for the Constitution was to have something called the Bill of Rights. And the purpose of the Bill of Rights was to prevent mob rule. So when I hear uh, when I hear um, people talk about mob rule and democracy, no, we can have a real democracy with a Bill of Rights. We don't need a a representative republic, as as a lot of Republicans would like okay. to say, see, because that's a saying. fallacy. We have a real democracy as long as we can provide, uh, we can make sure that everybody's rights guaranteed, and that is what I want. And what I'm saying is that it should be what you want. We shouldn't be having this debate about abortion. We should actually be having the debate about keeping people alive, about making sure people have the type of health care that they need to survive. 
when I hear you, my dear, beautiful lady, and I don't mean to be sexist, but when I hear you talk about abortion, I would ask you to put that same passion into healthcare because there's a hell of a lot more people dying because of lousy health care provided by conservatives as opposed to abortion we, that we have people have to take. Come up to us and tell us all the time. Why don't you push more of your efforts in all these other areas in taking care of born children and helping children get adopted to good and families? That's a true thing. Yes. Okay, yes. but I would I would ask you this. Why are not the people who are doing all those other ways of helping society improve doing anything for the pro-life movement? Why aren't they I, ever asked they, to do wait, wait, wait. It's, let, let's look. It's, it's, the, it's not the pro-life movement. It is the anti-abortion movement because I am pro-life. I believe okay. in your life and everybody's so. life. OK, it is the anti-abortion movement. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with the anti-abortion movement. Just keep it to those who want it. OK, were you against the abolitionists that pushed back against slavery or, or were you in favor of what they of their, of their I, the efforts? I, I look and, and you're going to make a very good point right there. I can I can read I the point, too, because they said sunlight was the best remedy to the yes. problem that was slavery. I, and they also I, said that there were no institutional frameworks in place to make it so that these newly freed slaves would have good lives. That's the same argument used to enshrine abortion. I, We're not going to give them great lives. You know, I love the way that is usually stretched, right? And that's fine. You know as well as I do that nobody wants to see partial births. Nobody wants right. to see all these things. Nobody. Right. And, and, and also, I think, if you want to be honest, uh, this and the reason why I don't call you a pro-life movement, I call you an anti-abortion anti movement. And I, I take that as a compliment. And that's fine. And but we need to get our nomenclatures or narrative correct. I believe that I leave. Just I want Jacinta to be able to do. And I'm gonna. We're we're way over, but I've uh, you know I enjoy. I really enjoyed talking to you because we're not having a shouting match. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me tell you. There's nothing that you said. I wanted you to change something in my mind because, like I said, I am. Whenever I get into these discussions, I'm hoping that I learn something that kept you so passionate at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, and there are times that my mind is not changed necessarily, but modified in the way that I I believe something. Unfortunately, you didn't do that because what I continue to see, no, and this is not a this is not a, a negative statement at all. Uh, what I what I hear from you is what I it's a, it, it's the same narrative, right? Uh, okay, you're, so you're hearing the buzzwords, and you're tired of the buzzwords. I, I know, but but what I'm saying is, it's not just buzzwords that I'm hearing. It is it is almost an uncaring, right? Uh, for why most women, and I didn't say all, it's mm -hmm. almost an uncaring for what a lot of women go through when and they're I, going to have an abortion. I can sympathize with you on that. I can sympathize with you on that. If I'm talking to girls who are considering their options, it is challenging because it's a lot easier to argue with a law than it is to convince a person to keep a baby, right? It's a lot easier to argue with a congressional member than it is to argue with a woman that is in crisis that needs help. So to that, I agree. This is callous because I want the issue to be black and white. With a woman who does need help, who is confused and doesn't know what to do, compassion is in order. And I agree with you. But we need to be clear about what that compassion is. Compassion is not gaslighting. And compassion is not ignoring the full story. Women want to keep their children. The reason why they abort is because they feel they are unsupported and because they have been lied to about what they are aborting. A lot of women who miscarry at nine weeks or who abort at nine weeks who abort at home, they see what was delivered from their body. They attest that this is not a blob of tissue. 
they're looking at a very small human being, but it's not a blob of tissue. And groups that abort for women regularly are regularly lying to them. That is problem number one. Problem number two is support. If a girl sees her unborn child on a sonogram, she's 85% more likely to keep her baby. That's the issue of it not being a blob of tissue that was corrected. If her boyfriend is there and agrees to help her with that pregnancy, that number goes up from 85% to 95%. Why? Because now she has the support to take care of her child. We have a maternal instinct to take care of the child that is within us. It is I, you unnatural. Know, I, you know, what, is so, what is so amazing with all that you're saying right there is you're actually making the points. The, you're just about making the points of the uh, those of us who are really pro-lifers, those of us who are really pro-choicers. And the reason why is it, that is something that we've always said. If we had a support system, abortions would go away. Now, it's not about not how it's not about this fight that you, you see you are fighting, in my opinion, the wrong fight. You should be fighting the healthcare fight. You should be fighting the fight to support women. You should be fighting. Those are the fights that you should have. I'm going to wait for the time that you're going to go home and you're going to think things or well, you're probably home already, but you're going to think things through and you're going to say at some time that guy that I just sent that letter to that brought me on just maybe he had a tad of stuff that I can actually change within. My yes. Stance. Yes. I will say I learned a lot from this interview. And so, if, if that's I, the approach that I need to take to get effective change accomplished, I will do that. And let me tell and, and like I said, if, if you really want to be a difference, you can be, but go where the problem really is. The problem isn't telling a woman don't abort. The problem is saying, and you had the answer. It's not me. You had the answer. Where oh, people you. are supported, mm-hmm. abortion goes away. Oh, yeah. Women don't want abortion. Mm-mm. But again, until that occurs, abortion will remain. And I want it to remain because abortion is also an economic issue. If you, Jacinta, if something happened to you, God forbid, and I won't use the word. No, I understand. And something happened to you, Mm -hmm. a bright young woman with a life ahead of her, that would materially change your life. And to tell me that you will never, ever consider, I just may have to do this because when I weigh things out here, that's the issue. Don't ever put yourself in that condition, in my humble opinion, that is. So Jacinta, let me tell you, I, I enjoyed the conversation. You're a very smart woman and you'll be, I mean very smart woman and uh you you make you can uh are you a lawyer i know (laughs) you know Um, so uh, but my dad is a poli sci major and we argue all the time so maybe i should think about that but 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 uh if you really in my opinion if you 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 can do so much more good for women (laughs) uh on the other side of the aisle so uh really consider that that. because um those are the women who need help. We don't need the attacks. Yes, what we need we are the help on women. So thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right, Jacinta Robin. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. We, anyway, folks, yes, some of you got tired of the uh, of the back and forth. But I tell you what, believe it or not, if you if you take a look at what she said at the end, you see that, you know, there are certain things that got to her and she is uh, very strong in her beliefs. And I tell you what, folks, a lot of conservatives are good people who have bad ideas, good people who simply don't see, like I told her, the uncaring of their beliefs, that their belief system brought down by a plutocracy who has enshrined a certain form of uh, uh, antiseptic hate into them. Uh, realize that when things are placed in different contexts. Anyhow, Bridge MCP, there is your sherry picked Bible. That was cute. That was cute. Anyhow, folks, uh, we are, that was a fairly long interview. Uh, one of the other things, let's see what, what we have here. Carl Cox says, 
Julie, what do you mean by hidden sins? Leftist ideas are bad for everyone except authoritarian dictators. You keep believing that, Mike. Um, you know, I mean, uh, like I like I tell folks when we are trying to, as we are trying to inform folks, there are some people who, for willfully ignorant reasons, will maintain their belief system because they can, they can, they can, they can be engulfed in it. Uh, they can feel uh, sort of cozy within it because it speaks many times or, or, or it gives their deficiencies oftentimes a reason. I will never live for that. I will continue to try to do right by folks. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Eric says, Sister MCP, we lost our first two and that was a bad thing. And just, and we, sorry to hear about that, Eric. Uh, we're blessed with two good that are 16 and 18 now, beautiful children of yours. Yes, they are. Think in terms of value. Um, Julie Henderson says, Carl Cox, many Catholics have hidden sins, boy rape, alcoholism, sex. I mean, look, we have a whole lot of that, right? Again, it, many of the things that you find folks in the religious realm do just proves that... <laughs> Well, I don't want to say their their concepts are unsustainable because I do know some folks in a religious realm that actually live their beliefs and live their context, but it's not not many that you find doing that. Mike Sisak said the pro life argument is based on science and the law against murder. No, it's not based on science because science cannot determine science can determine biology, biological formats. Uh, it cannot. It cannot talk about a soul or anything like that. And it was interesting because uh, uh, earlier Rudnan brought up a, a notion about it, for those who are religious and follow the Bible, what the Bible says, which is what the life begins when you take your first breath. Right. So, I mean, right. The, if the Bible says life begins when you take the first breath, you know, that that should to me, that should put to, to the religious folks. That is a lot to, to move, you know, a cell. One cell of my body can be used to create another me. So, I mean, when it comes to biology, I, I, I heard you, Mike C. said, giving uh, 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 Bridge MCP a hard time. The fact of the matter is, no, Bridge MCP knew what she was talking about. I think there's a lot about science that you don't understand, Mike, and I think it behooves you to actually learn what the science methodology really is. Uh, Bridge MCP is quite knowledgeable in that, and I think you should realize that. Daniela Do says, whoa, wait, uh, wait, uh, humanist now wants us to uh, prive a soul before we are allowed to live? Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying for religious people who believe in the Bible, then they ought to listen to what their Bible tells them, which says life begins with the first breath. It's that simple. That's not at all difficult to understand, sir. Egberto, she was saying that sperm is a person. No, she was not saying sperm is a person. Read exactly what she was trying to point out. Roberto Lewis says, Saludo mi gente, politics and right. Great topic. I wish I could have a call to talk to this young girl. The lady was bright. She was bright. Now, um, and I agree. She, she's a bright woman. She's just wrong on her stance on abortion and, and having wanting to control somebody else's body. But I, I, I you know, I, that's why I spoke to her. Well, I, always, I speak to everybody kindly, but, you know, um, I wanted her to feel comfortable. And I, she did feel very comfortable with the discussion. And she would like to talk again and I uh, keep the lines of communication open. But then again, that's what we do here in the PDR Posse. We love everybody. We stay in touch with everybody. Anyhow, uh, it's near the end of the show. But before I go, I want to remind you guys that uh, please support the show. by. And I, I said going forward, I will only be given one link. And you can choose from that link how, how you would want to support uh, Politics Done Right. But we do need your support. This is this Pro this project is supported solely by you. No magic, no nothing. Politics Done Right is yours and supported by you. So I ask you so kindly 
to go to politicsandright.com slash support and provide whatever support. We have a lot of different support options from buying books to buying stuff to uh, giving us PayPal, Cash App, any one of those things. Go to politicsandright.com slash support. Please support the program. We cannot keep doing these valuable things unless we continue to get the support from you. We have great supporters, but again, we, we try not to put it all onto the hands of just a few. If we could get thousands of people given just a little bit, we could really expand. We could really get the help that we need to get to really continue to bring you good uh, good narratives, good information, etc. I just signed up with a an AI based um, product that will help me with my TikTok and my, my TikTok and Instagram and Reels on Facebook and YouTube. So that is going to reduce my that portion of my work by about twenty five percent. Of so I've been playing with it, and it seems like it'll give me a twenty five percent help in the amount of time it takes to uh, do these things. So, uh, and all these things cost, again, we do that cost time analysis. So please support the program by going to politicsandright.com slash support. I'm putting that back in again, politicsandright.com slash support and support us however you can. Uh, we've got to close this baby down now. My name is Egbert. Lee Grant says the New Testament makes reference to the unborn child. Uh, Mike, let's see. I saw something about the Bible. Mike C. Sex says the Bible actually says life begins at the quickening, which is the first kick. Um, <laughs> I love the way you guys just invent stuff, right? It is amazing. E2247 says PDR mission statement inspires and brims uh, with goodwill. Worth reading. It is the first thing you'll see. Thank you so kindly, my dear brother, E2247. Please, again, support us at politicsandright.com. Just support. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right. And you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.